Ahoy Hawaii, Pryor here and welcome to the inside of the latest generation Range Rover Sport. So unlike say Land Rover's Discovery Sport and the full fat big Discovery, the Range Rover Sport and Range Rover, full fat Range Rover, are much more similar things. So the Range Rover came out not very long ago, we drove it just a few months ago. And now the Range Rover Sport has followed because it lives on the same platform which is now a new architecture, I think MLA, largely aluminium. The engine's in the front, it's uh, longitudinally mounted and it's a different thing. Whereas the, like, the small Evoque, Range Rover Evoque and the Land Rover Discovery Sport have like a transverse engine, or predominantly, I want to say, I mean they're all four wheel drive, but I want to say, you know, it's, it's a kind of front led platform. This is more of a traditional rear led platform. It comes with an 8 speed automatic transmission, a low range transfer case, air suspension which can raise uh, and lower itself and so on and the similarities in the two mechanically go a lot further still I mean this has got active rear steer in the same way that the big Range Rover has it sits a little bit lower I think the wheelbase is actually the same even but it does sit a little bit lower the, the scuttle in the cabin is just a little bit lower it is a more dynamic version of but still a very luxurious Range Rover and as time goes on Range Rover is keen to push this brand up market, it uses the phrase modern luxury, it wants to think of itself, and I don't know, you tell me if you think this is fair, it wants to think of itself as something like Rolex or Hermes or some other fashionable luxury brand. Now from a pricing perspective, I get where it's coming from. This Range Rover Sport starts at about £80,000 in the UK, that's for a D300 diesel, then there's a raft of other engine options. This one is a plug-in hybrid, no less, leading up to uh, the full-fat V8, which it takes from BMW, that V8 engine. And in there will be an SVR later, you would imagine. And those prices at the moment are going up to like 116, 120 grand before options or something like that. And they will get more expensive when you would imagine that SVR will arrive. Now that engine, V8 engine family, makes up to in the BMW M5 CS. It's got over 600 horsepower, isn't it? About 620, something like that. So the next gen SVR could be, I don't know if Land Rover will be allowed to give it that much power or even if it wants to, but that could be quite, quite, quite a thing. But back to this plug-in hybrid, it's quite a long range, the pluggable one. It's uh, electric only range is up to something like 70 miles, which is pretty good going. I haven't done a full economy test. I have done one in a Land Rover Defender plug-in hybrid, which uses the same sort of technology as you would expect. And when it's in electric only mode, obviously no uses no fuel at all. And then if you sort of leave it on um, a mode where it's gradually taking the battery from full down to empty, that takes quite a long time and is pretty good going. And it'll do something like 60 odd to the gallon while it's doing that and that extends its you know its hybrid hybridized pluggable range by by a reasonable amount if that battery is completely depleted and then you're just on effectively the engine charging the battery alone rather than any stuff that you had left from the plug-in then economy takes a real hit but depending on your use case i think in the defender it was like 20 high 20s to the gallon which is you know not great but it, it, depending on your use case I think this is really, you know, plug-in hybrid technology can be a real useful bridging gap if you usually do not very many miles as a commute, but actually at weekends you stick a tow bar on the back in a trailer or a horse box or a boat or a caravan or whatever, in which case pure EVs are probably not for you. You just get that extra versatility, you still get the pulling power of a big, big, genuine SUV, you get its weight which is helpful when it comes to whatever you're towing. So I think it's a useful thing, depending on your use case, this could be the one. And the rest of it to drive, well, it's very, very refined. Is it as refined as the full fat Range Rover? It's not far off, you know. So I got in it yesterday, had the windows open just until the aircon sort of woke up a bit. And I got onto a motor and I thought I'd better shut the windows. And it just becomes so quiet. You just whisper quiet, you know, you could you could you know talk very quietly and passengers in the back would absolutely hear you. Isolation is really good. No, not as good as a full size Range Rover. I say full size, but they're both similar size. 
I say actually not quite as good as the full size thing, but really, really good. And then there's the dynamic stuff, which Land Rover tends to do quite well. I mean, it's not perfect at everything, especially if you've read customer reliability satisfaction surveys, you'll know it doesn't do that brilliantly. Uh, it's got the latest generation, it's PV Pro touchscreen system. So Land Rover, because it's an off-road brand, insists on having uh, the terrain response, which controls traction, stability control, wheel control, throttle response, all that sort of thing. It wouldn't hurt if that was just on the touchscreen, because you don't need it very often. And actually, this space was given over to a controller that controlled the touchscreen. It's not bad, as touchscreens go, but there's a lot on it. And so to the stuff that Land Rover does do very well, which tends to be ride, handling, steering, cabin isolation, response, and it does that really well here. This is a really nice car to drive. It's a very relaxing car to drive, but body control is terrific. It feels quite agile. It's got the active rear steer system, so at low speeds it helps you turn. Actually maneuvering around sort of off-road tracks, through farm gates, things like that, the rear steer is an absolute godsend. And it would just be handy in car parks. And let's face it, that's where it will get most of its use rather than out in the sticks, but it's really useful in either place. I like this car a great deal. It feels plush inside. There are some plastics which are not as good as, as others. And if you're talking pure luxury, where are you trying to extend this car to? Are you saying pure luxury the same way that Bentley or Rolls Royce is pure luxury? It's not there, it's not close to being there. But it is a very plush, relaxed, refined interior. We'll get it in the UK soon, where we'll do some better tests with it. We'll take it off-road, we'll take it on-road, we'll put it against some rivals. But meantime, thank you for joining me for this brief-ish first drive. There's a full written review over at UK or in the magazine or digital subscription. There's new stuff at AutoCardic.co.uk all the time. And there's new videos on here. Uh, we're starting to pick up actually the video output. Again, we had a, a, a few months where we didn't have a videographer. We've now got one again. Hi, Jack. And uh, things will be moving along. So thanks for joining me. If you like it, I'd be very grateful. If you subscribe, I'd be even more grateful. And I'll see you next time.